Welcome to everybody who's attending this online event. Um, today we are discussing the political economy of slavery from two um, angles. Uh, it's in the context of the new translation of uh, Marcus Redicus, The Slave Ship, and uh, Caitlin Rosenthal's Accounting for Slavery. So I'm really happy that you both are here to present your books and maybe have a discussion about the political economy of slavery. Before we get into the discussion about the books, um, I want to introduce uh, the both of you first. So maybe start with, um, yeah, Marcus. Marcus Redica is a distinguished professor of Atlantic history at the University of uh, Pittsburgh. Um, his works include The Slave Ship, A Human History, which we are discussing today, um, and um, also a book that is all, also being uh, already translated into German, The Many-Headed um, Hydra. So thank you for coming, and uh, we are very happy to have you here. Uh, the second book we are discussing is Caitlin Rosenthal's book. So uh, Caitlin is an um, historian at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, she worked for the consulting firm um, McKinsey and Company before receiving her doctorate from Harvard University. Um, and her book has also, just like Marcus's book, won several awards. So we are very happy to also have you here. Thanks for coming. Um, we discussed that maybe before we start about uh, talking about the books, that it's good to um, have a brief introduction into what um, slavery is actually about, um, to explain a bit maybe what is the phenomenon of modern slavery we are talking about, what is the transatlantic slave trade and the plantation slavery system in the Americas. So maybe you, Marcus and Caitlin can give a brief introduction into the topic before we talk about your books. Okay. Thank you, Bafta. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, when I told my wife that I was speaking today with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, she said, do your best to live up to the name. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, the Atlantic slave trade. And I think the best way to introduce it is from a quote from the great African-American scholar activist W.E.B. Du Bois, who said, the Atlantic slave trade is the most magnificent drama of the last 1,000 years. And by that he meant millions of African people expropriated from their homelands, forced to travel in horrific slave ships across the Atlantic, and then to produce wealth in almost unimagin unimaginable quantities for the owners of the plantation system. Those people, Du Bois said, descended into hell. And the evocation of hell was the main purpose of the book that I wrote, The Slave Ship, A Human History. The slave trade, we need to understand, was an event, an event that lasted almost 400 years. And we need to, we need to know this. this. This trade in human flesh was so profitable that it went on for a very long time. Most really uh, violent episodes in human history are relatively brief. Uh, for example, the, the Nazi Holocaust, uh, six years, six million people killed. But in this case, the extreme, extremely violent uh, uh, Atlantic slave trade went on for almost 400 years. The current numbers are that roughly 12 and a half to 13 million people were loaded onto slave ships in West and West Central Africa. Around 10 million of those people, 10 and a half, were delivered alive on the other side of the Atlantic uh, in North America, the Caribbean, uh, and South America, especially, I would emphasize, the Caribbean and Brazil. Um, and you'll notice a discrepancy of a couple of million uh, people in those two numbers in terms of loaded and delivered. Those are the people who died in the Middle Passage, their bodies thrown over the rails of the ship every morning to the schools of sharks that followed the slave ships all the way across the Atlantic. So there was this greedy rush of the European maritime powers to uh, a search for black gold 
we might call it. Uh, Portugal led the way. Spain played a major part. The Netherlands, England, France, the United States were all major players in the slave trade. Uh, lesser players included Denmark, Sweden, and Germany, of course. The Brandenburg Company was a slave trading company, but I would emphasize that that is not the full extent of German involvement. There was a lot of financial involvement. There was manufacturing for the slave trade. So uh, there's really no place to stand outside of this process. Uh, the results of the Atlantic slave trade were truly extraordinary. First and foremost, this made possible the creation and the sustaining of a truly uh, revolutionary economic form of organization, and that was the plantation. The slave ship and the plantation are the two main institutions of the Atlantic slave system. Now, I, I we can talk about this later if you like, but I want to submit to you from the very beginning that we still live every day of our lives with the consequences of the Atlantic slave trade. It is still present in all kinds of ways. So the slave ship is actually a ghost ship that haunts our modern consciousness. Those ships, in many ways, are still sailing. We still live with their consequences. So that's just a brief summary of the trade. To add on to that picture, um, I think that where I would want to start when I'm thinking about the plantation system as opposed to the slave trade is again with the scale. You know, when I was a graduate student, um, even beginning a PhD program, I don't think I had fully grasped the extent of the scale of American slavery, both in its global connections and collections to the West Indies and beyond, but also its scale within this U.S. economic story. So some of the work that I do connects to um, the, the period when the slave trade is still going on, but really in some ways the story of uh, plantation slavery in the U.S. is about how slavery survives and expands even after the closing of the Atlantic slave trade. Um, Marcus gave you a few numbers um, about the slave trade and the numbers for the uh, slavery in the American South are also very, very large. Even though the um, mainland North America receives only a minority of um, arrivals from the slave trade, a brutal system emerges where both um, through an internal slave trade and through the exploitation of human reproduction, we grow to almost 4 million slaves on the eve of the Civil War. And American planters, um, the biggest of whom are growing cotton, sugar, um, and some other, some other staples, are thinking about people um, all the time as both labor and capital. They're thinking about their productive capacity, their reproductive capacity, and in a sense of thinking about people as inputs in the national capital and as stock. So that 4 million people on the eve of the U.S. Civil War um, is almost $4 billion in invested capital. And as the Civil War breaks out, one of the reasons um, that the South offers for seceding is to protect that investment. They, they feel that their investment is at risk and they're going to war to protect their ownership of 3 to $4 billion in people. And to just give a bit of context, that's several times larger than the invested capital in any other area of the American economy. So at this moment where capitalism is already kind of on an explosive growth trajectory, the largest single area of invested capital in the United States is the invested in enslaved people. Um, so not only this, but the kind of slave economy is connected to every other growing part of the American economy. Of course, cotton as a staple is connected to textiles, the most important uh, of, of factories. Um, and then also cotton, as we're getting to know more and more, um, cotton and slavery itself are deeply embedded in financial systems, important to insurance, important to banking. And we know that um, slavery played a role in developing insurance and mortgage industries as well. So we're just fully understanding the many parts of the economy that slavery touches. And I think Marcus left us in a great moment to kind of think we're still living in the world that slavery brought us into. Yeah, thank you both for this um, introduction. And I think that's also very greatly leads to um, your book. So maybe we can start with your book, Marcus, because it's 
a bit older. Um, can you maybe um, give us a little bit of an input on what your book about, is about and um, what your main theses are? Sure, thank you. Yes, uh, the main argument of my book, Slave Ship of Human History, is that the slave ship was a machine, a technology, and one of the most important technologies in the rise of capitalism. Uh, the violent regime of the slave ship created two extremely important things. On the one hand, it created labor power on an international scale that would drive the plantation system for 250 years. Okay, and this is in many ways the most dynamic element of the world economy in that time period. A second thing that the slave ship does is that it helps to create categories of race. And let me illustrate what I mean by that. Let's imagine a voyage of a slave ship from Liverpool to the west coast of Africa. A motley crew of sailors are hired. They are English, they're Irish, they're Dutch, they may be French, and some sailors are African or of African descent. When they arrive on the west coast of Africa, all of those people, regardless of their skin color, become the white men by virtue of the fact that they are in control of this ship, the technology. In parallel fashion, a group of multi-ethnic Africans, sometimes 15 or 20 different ethnicities or nations, are loaded onto the slave ship. They cross the Atlantic, and they are unloaded as members of a common Negro race. So here you see how racial categories are created and reproduced. Uh, a central concept to this book, like some of my other books, is primitive accumulation. The primitive accumulation of capital, which is the accumulation of the bodies of workers. Uh, this did not happen only in England, folks. It happened around the world, and it's still going on today. So the separation of millions of people from their means of subsistence in West and West Central Africa, this is probably the greatest moment of proletarianization in world history at that time. In some ways, I would say it's the degree zero of expropriation. And this is crucial, as we know, to the rise of capitalism. So that's one big theme of my book, which is about a history from above. Now the history from below. The role of resistance on board the slave ship is very important. And in fact, it's the only redeeming feature of this uh, awful story. The truth is that the enslaved people on these tens of thousands of ships were extraordinarily creative in fighting back. You can see the slave trade as a 400-year hunger strike, because this was a constant form of resistance employed by the, the enslaved. There were also many, many insurrections. Really crucial to know this. For a long time, we thought there had been very few, but recent research has illustrated that uh, these uprisings were, were, were more or less constant. Then there's the cultural creativity of the multi-ethnic people locked down in the lower deck, where they are speaking new words, inventing new languages, new songs, new dances, and even inventing what anthropologists call fictive kinship. In other words, biological structures of kinship have been very largely destroyed by the slave trade. So what people are doing now on the lower decks of the ship is inventing kinship, calling each other brother and sister and aunt and uncle, and trying to create a sense of solidarity from that. So the captives constantly assert their humanity in this extremely dehumanizing situation. Uh, and in my view, all histories of slavery must include both the violent oppression of the slave system, but they also must include the heroic resistance of the people who fought back against it. And that is what I've tried to do in uh, the slave ship of human history. Thank you, Marcus, for this input. I think especially um, your point about uh, writing a history from below is something we will get back 
uh, to later in the discussion. Um, maybe Caitlin, you can continue with a brief introduction into your book. I think one of the things that ties my book together with Marcus's is that they're both really about technology for labor extraction. Um, and they're both about how we can learn more about slavery by thinking about the way that enslavers um, both used and created new technologies to maximize their profits and to exploit labor. Um, my book, Accounting for Slavery, does this mostly as a history from above. Um, in some sense, it's an attempt to correct the history of American business practices, which is a, an incredible and rich field, which has almost entirely neglected Ameri um, American slavery. Alfred Chandler, still the preeminent business historian, described American slavery as a fundamentally ancient form of production. And he does this even as he points out ways that it's sophisticated. So what accounting for slavery does is it walks through some of the business practices that are considered to be milestones in the emergence of capitalism. Um, it talks about organizational structure and how plantations in the West Indies look almost like M form American corporations. Um, it looks at scientific management of labor um, and the way that planters measured output, particularly in cotton picking, um, how many pounds per person per day on a relentless um, scale that looks a lot like scientific management as it emerges in free factories in the early 20th century. And it also explores um, depreciation, how planters could look at people and think about them as assets that appreciated and depreciated using some of the same language and then some same calculating techniques that we see emerging in industries like the railroads. And in a way, it's going through this series of landmark events uh, and showing that in each of these cases, slaveholders were using this techniques. And in some cases, they're using them as early or even earlier than um, um, they were being used in free labor. And by pulling slavery into this story of the emergence of capitalist business practices, it's helping us to think deeply about the ways that innovation and violence could go together. And you know, there still exists in, especially in business history and especially in kind of popular narratives, this idea that capitalism is about a series of, uh, of innovations and that those innovations are accompanying freedom. And this is a story about how all of those same innovations could be blended with violence. And the hope is that by seeing the ways slaveholders blended violence and innovation, we can continue to see the ways um, that you know, modern corporations using data practices are blending violence and innovation as well in different ways and on different scales, but it can help us to look for coercion and data, coercion um, and calculation going hand in hand. Yeah, thank you also for your input. Um, I would uh, continue with a little bit of a discussion maybe for the audience and then we can get into the Q&A. So maybe Marcus, um, your book uh, was only now translated into German, but it is already about 15, 16 years old. So maybe you can tell us about um, if your book um, is still current. I mean, it's current enough to be translated into German. So I think uh, your main points in the book are still... Uh, you know, up to date. It's it's a historical book, but uh, maybe there's something you uh, changed your point of view about in the last 15 years, or maybe there's something you wanted to add, but now only now thought of. So can you tell us about maybe if there's any updates uh, on your thesis within the last 15 years? I think the book holds up pretty well, Bafta, in terms of uh, its primary arguments. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, scholars in the field uh, accept those arguments. I think subsequent research has expanded mm -hmm. uh, some of this work. I, I think specifically of Shawanda Mustakim, whose book Slavery at Sea talks about the manufacturing of bodies. This was something that I talked about in a more limited way. Mm -hmm. I think if I had the book to do over at this point in time, I would... Uh, do more with the merchants. Mm -hmm. In my decision in concentrating the history from below was to understand the ship as a social world, mm -hmm. to understand the experience of the enslaved people on the lower deck, but also to understand the experience of the sailors who made the ships go, and especially the captains and officers who were really the representatives of capital on board the ship. Mm 
I didn't include the merchants because that book was already very long. Um, and so I, I didn't want to make it longer, but I am keenly aware that a lot of what happened on those ships was determined by people at a great distance from it. Mm -hmm. What's happening on the West Coast of Africa depends on decisions that are being taken in London and Amsterdam and Paris and other European uh, and American capitals. So I, I, I wish I had been able to complete the full circuit, you might say, of capital and mm -hmm. labor. But uh, but there's a new good book by Nicholas Radburn on this subject, uh, Traders of Men. And so I think the, the, the work is still growing. And I, and I would just like to second something that Caitlin said. Mm -hmm. uh, even though the body of scholarship on slavery and resistance and abolition over the past 60 years, even though that might be the best body of scholarship produced anywhere in the world in this period, I, I, it is absolutely true, as Caitlin said, we are still learning so much about this system. A lot of really creative books, including hers, have been published in recent years. So, mm -hmm. we, you know, this subject is, is still uh, something that we are investigating and learning, from, learning about. If I can add to that, I think there's so much resistance um, to people thinking about the extent to which slavery is capitalist. There's a wonderful article about management history by Bill Cook called The Denial of Slavery in Management Studies. Mm -hmm. And he goes through a series of people making similar arguments to the one that I make and over a long period of time. And yet the argument has to be made again. I mean, it's it's like it's been made. It's been the 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 evidence has been presented, and yet this um, the story hasn't gotten through. And when I talk with people about my work, I find that some people are just totally shocked and surprised. They can't believe that American slaveholders were using these modern calculative business techniques. And other people say, "Well, haven't we known that for fifty years already?" And I think that this is the kind of challenge of being part of a, a story like an American story, but also a broader Atlantic story of reckoning with slavery is that we know some things, but the kind of having them be known in a real and public uh, way is this a kind of ongoing, ongoing challenge. And I also think that, um, I don't know, maybe it's different than the US, but um, there always has to be the right context for books like these, for arguments like these to be perceived. And I feel like in the last years, especially after the Black Lives Matter protest that happened in 2020, there has been a bit of a shift in the discussion and people are now more interested in looking at the continuities between colonialism, slavery and the current capitalism that is still racialized, that still over exploits some people. And I feel like now is a little bit of a different political context where people are more welcome to these kinds of arguments than maybe 10 years ago. You know, I think, Bapta, it's almost always true yeah. that movements from below open up new space for historical discussion. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I know that uh, the slave ship had new life after the execution of George Floyd. Yes. A lot of people wanted, were suddenly interested in the long history of, uh, of that moment. Uh, so, so I think this is, you know, to think about the relationship between movements that demand change and the way that history gets rewritten in that context is something else that is really important for the, for the understanding of slavery. I mean, the civil rights movement and the black power movement, the two of them combined, really mm -hmm. generated this breakthrough with this massive body of scholarship. They wanted, demanded a new history. We need a history in the United States and around the world that takes race and slavery seriously. All those things Caitlin said about how these arguments are just brushed off. You know, the dominant interpretations uh, proved very sturdy until these movements kind of broke through. Yeah. And I think this is also maybe a little bit of a different motivation for um, this kind of research than just academic scholarship, but it's situated in these political movements and uh, political demand for change, you know, in these, in the context of these like anti-racist, anti-colonial movements um, that also researched within the last years, I would say. Um, yeah, before we continue on that, uh, maybe to you, Caitlin, 
Um, in another interview um, of you, I uh, watched about your book. You said that you actually started your research on uh, big businesses and you mainly looked at free wage labor. So how did you come to study slavery and how did your research focus shift uh, into this direction? I mean, in a, in a way, the story of my book is a story of my own discovery of how big slavery was. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I mean, I was someone who knew about slavery, but had thought of it as something that could be thought, but be seen as separate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was a, it wasn't from where I was from. It was a horrible system that was big, but I didn't understand that it was connected to absolutely everything. Um, as you mentioned in the introduction, I was a management consultant and I was the, you know, the most junior person on the team. And I was sitting in the basement of these big corporations with a spreadsheet doing the information. And then my information was the data I was calculations I was making were being filtered up um, and people were using them to make decisions about people's lives. Um, and the people who had the data I was generating and also myself didn't have to think about um, the individuals whose lives were actually impacted by that information. The data was creating this kind of distance and this layer of abstraction. And I think that this happens at scale. Uh, data makes things visible, but it also can make humans invisible at the same time. So that's the question that sent me um, to look at a, accounting for labor to begin with. And I spent, I thought that that story was going to be in free factories on the railroads. And indeed, some of that story is there. But midway through my research, um, Stanley Engerman gave me a set of plantation account books. And they were as sophisticated as anything I had seen in the degree to which they tracked labor productivity. They were just measuring and monitoring enslaved people in a way that was, I think, impossible in a free factory. You look at factory records from the early 19th century, there's so much turnover. People are quitting all the time. And quitting gives people a certain power. And on plantations, people couldn't quit. So it made sense for planters to measure and monitor day in, day out, and to use that data. And so that pulled me into the story where I was exploring how slavery created some of the same techniques on an even more intense scale and the same violence and abstraction that I was expecting to find in free factories. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned that, uh, you know, sometimes when we look at number, it numbers, it disguises that we are talking about people. So we had this discussion before, but can you maybe elaborate on, and you also, Marcus, on maybe a little bit on the violence of abstraction? You know, Marcus referenced the, you know, the distance at which so, some of the people who are making the biggest decisions about people's lives are at the greatest distance. Um in the U.S. South, most planters lived on plantations, so they they but um, there were many absentee planters, and for the biggest plantations, many planters are absentee. And this is an early example of the, the separation of labor um, of of um, ownership and of uh, management and capital. So the people who are making the decisions um, and the people who own the capital don't have to confront some of the worst realities of the plantation system, and in Marcus's case, the slave ship. Um, there's a way that looking at numbers, I think, makes some of this violence easier. Uh, it's not the numbers that are doing the violence, because numbers can also make things visible. But I think the numbers facilitate some of the violence, um, especially the worst extremes. Yeah. Yes, I, I would add to that that, I mean, one of the things I was writing against in the slave ship was the more statistical understandings of the slave trade. Uh, I felt as though this sanitized the history, cleaned up the bloodshed, um, and it also makes it harder for us to wrestle with the moral enormity of this slave system. We, we really need uh, the, a human history in order to understand this morally and politically. Uh, for me, the, the greatest single expression I've ever read of this idea of the violence of abstraction uh, was in a novel, a really magnificent novel by Barry Unsworth called Sacred Hunger, a novel about the slave trade. And he has two Liverpool merchants who have a ship off the west coast of Africa sitting in a, in a, a beautiful business office in Liverpool surrounded by almanacs and statistical reports and ledgers and documents. 
And what Unsworth says is, there was no way these two could actually have pictured in their own minds what was happening on their ship on the west coast of Africa. And even if they had been able to, they would have chosen not to, because horror can choke the mind. Better to remain safely in the world of the abstract. And uh, some of the classical political economists uh, created a, a, a statistical language as a way of understanding the slave trade, partly, I'm convinced, to hide from themselves uh, what they were all a part of. Mm -hmm. And that was this violence on an almost unimaginable scale. Yeah. This is something I also found interesting because in your book, you mentioned these like individual stories. And sometimes when we look at these numbers, we hear, for example, 13, 13 million people uh, from the African continent have been enslaved. I think it's difficult for us to really understand that these has, have been 30 million individual people with, you know, a history, a family who... Um, who are people, you know, just like you and me, who have dreams and aspirations, and all these people have been enslaved and put into this inhumane system of, you know, the slave ship first, and then this whole plantation economy. And I, I think it's something we should um, try to think of when we talk about these histories. Um, but at the same time, I sometimes feel like when we talk about slavery, I don't know if it's the same in the US, but in Germany, a lot of times um, it's very moralized. So people have this very moralistic understanding of slavery. They think it's wrong. They think it's something historical, something despicable that we have overcome with, um, you know, the abolition of slavery in the Americas, but also in the colonies. And that, uh, you know, this historization of slavery sometimes leads to this understanding that slavery has been this pre-capitalist thing that has been replaced by free wage labor, which is completely different from slavery. And I mean, this is a discussion within Marxist theory, but also outside Marxist theory on whether um, this kind of plantation slavery system that existed in the Americas is something that is pre-capitalist or a capitalist form of labor. And I would even say that I think within Marxian theory um, in the German context, where it's mainly an intellectual tradition, I think most people would even say um, what is distinctly capitalist is free wage labor and everything before that has been abolished with the emerge of slavery and bourgeois society. So um, what are your positions on this discussion and have you any thought on, or thoughts on that? I think that slavery is a part of capitalism. And I've, I, you know, that one of the things in my book, I talk very little about capitalism, actually, because I wanted to people to see the violence of the accounts, which which show both the individual and the um, the quantity, like the data, both of those. I, I didn't want that to be entangled in the discussion of capitalism. But in other places, I've tried to think about how we can define capitalism. Um, and in so many conversations about slavery, I'm presented with this idea that free wage labor is just simply different. And as someone coming in a way, thinking back to my, my time consulting, I was thinking to myself, wages are just a, like a format of pay. Wages are, are just a kind of a form of paying someone um, or a form of exploitation. And how could we define this massive system that's about power and markets and the ways they get entangled with each other by the kind of format of pay. And so the thing that I thought for me, what underlies wage labor that makes it so persuasive thinking about capitalism is, is that wage labor is a sign that labor is highly commoditized mm -hmm. um, and that um, labor can be treated as merely an input of production. Mm -hmm. And I think that we see this same thing happening under slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, someone owns the entirety of someone's life rather than only a mere bit of time, but the, the power relation is not so different. And the entanglement with the market is also similar. It, this is most striking looking at um, records from this, um, the internal slave trade right before the U.S. Civil War. And there you find, um, for example, price lists that treat people as if they're interchangeable, as if you could have any any boy of a certain height or any um, woman um, with her first child, and as if these could be priced the same and treated as if they're interchangeable. Um, 
one sign of commodification is whether there's a futures market for something. There were never exactly futures markets for enslaved people, but there are moments when people talk about enslaved people in the same language that they use in futures markets. And they even talk about grading them as if they were commodities. Um, so I think the, there is a, a very different form of relationship than the one we've become used to. Um, but in some ways, the underlying power structure is, is very, very different, uh, is very similar. You know, uh, Bafta, let me uh, just tell you a brief story, which I think speaks to the issue you raised. Uh, in, in, I've given probably a hundred or more talks about this book, The Slave Ship, over the years and in many different parts of the world. And one of the things that I find is that some people try to put this history safely in the past, as if to say that's over, we don't have to deal with that, it's done. Uh, I gave a lecture on this subject in Amsterdam in September, and I noticed that toward the end of the lecture, there was a, an elderly woman sitting in the first row, a woman of African descent, who was crying. And I spoke to her afterwards, and she told me the story of sitting on the lap of her great-grandmother who was an enslaved person in Suriname. This is all so recent. This is all so recent. It's not past. Uh, as William Faulkner said, uh, that the past isn't dead. It's not even past. Mm -hmm. So it's so this is a, a living thing. Uh, in terms of the, the debate that you mentioned, uh, in, in my view, uh, slave labor is definitely uh, a capitalist form of labor. Capital itself is a promiscuous creature. In other words, it doesn't just have one partner. It needs many different kinds of labor. Uh, it needs paid labor as well as unpaid labor. It needs wage labor. It needs domestic labor. It needs slave labor. It, it so So... To say that uh, wage labor is the only or even the defining feature of capitalism, I think, is to narrow our historical understanding of the rise of capitalism. But it also leaves out uh, a tremendous number of, uh, of, of people, the larger part of humanity, who, who helped to create the value of capitalism, who helped to reproduce labor who helped to do all of these things. Uh, Peter Linebaugh and I wrote about this in, in the book, The Many-Headed Hydra, in which we reached back to the older idea of the proletariat mm -hmm. as a kind of multi-ethnic uh, living class of sorts, rather than the idea of the modern working class, which tends to be national. We wrote a book about the Atlantic proletariat. And what you'll find is that the that capitalism is older and the struggles against capitalism are also older and deeper and I think more inspirational than we sometimes uh, appreciate. Yeah, I would agree. But um, I think this also raises the question um, on how we would explain the abolition of slavery, which has been a very public discussion, so we can read about it. And I think one of the most important arguments that was made for the abolition of slavery, and I think was also the most relevant argument in the end, was that it's not that efficient for capital. So slavery has been abolished because it's not efficient enough for slavery, and wage labor is the consequent you know, a form of labor for capitalist mode of production. So how would you explain the abolition of slavery, especially in the U.S. context, maybe or in the civil war context um, within this framework of capitalist slavery? I mean, looking back to the eve of the civil war, you see lots of southern slaveholders talking about how inefficient slavery is. And I think that's because they want to keep their slaves. Um, I think uh, it's a a moment that not everyone was always earning profits through slavery, but many people earn huge profits. Um, but I think in an effort to defend the system, a lot of claims are made about how slavery is not as as profitable as it is. And then I think at the same time, you see free labor and abolitionists in the North also making claims about slavery being inefficient. So you have, in a sense, before the, before the U.S. Civil War, both sides 
are arguing that slavery is not that efficient. But if you go back and look at the um, expansion of enslaved capital and the profits earned in cotton in the South overall, slavery was just tremendously profitable. Not always and for everyone, but in um, and a whole and for many people, it was remarkably um, uh, efficient. And I think that, you know, you can see examples where slavery is being used in urban areas, uh, examples where people are using wage and slave labor. Like there's a, a great article about Maryland Chemical Works where they employ slave labor in a few positions where because they need to guarantee the continuity of those positions, but then they use wage labor to substitute. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's a version of of capitalism where we don't have an American Civil War and the kind of wage labor and slave labor are merged and are work together in more settings. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when I teach the civil war for undergraduates, I argue that the civil war is won because of the help of enslaved people um, because of their resistance. And I try to think about the slave um, the civil war as in some ways resistance against capitalism. Now, it's not resistance against capitalism for everyone, but I think re resistance against capitalism is one ingredient um, in why the slit civil war is so successful. And I think the merging of resistance of enslaved people with the rise of abolitionism, um, there's ways in which that is connected to capitalism, but I think it's also fun in many fundamental ways. It's a kind of reformative, anti-capitalist labor regulation um, mode. So, And the... In the end, there's lots of continuities between capitalism before and after slavery, but I think there's this possibility in the moment of the Civil War that there could be more um, victory over capitalism. Yeah, yeah and I my, think I, my approach is is quite similar, Caitlin. Yeah. Uh, just because two different forms of uh, labor are both capitalist in some fundamental way doesn't mean that they can't still have structural antagonisms between them. In other words, uh, slavery in, in the American South produced commodities for the world market. It was a fully integrated capitalist system in that sense. But its primary way of organizing that labor was different uh, and was antagonistic to the free labor ideology of the North. So, so the, the fact that you can you can have two different uh, societies or even cultures, you might even say civilizations, uh, fighting within the same nation state, I think we've seen that in history many times. So, I don't think that in itself means that we can't uh, we can't still understand the the conflict that leads. Uh, to the to the Civil War. But the, the other thing I would mention is that slave labor and free labor are not Weberian ideal types. They're material organizations of labor. And the way that I find it most useful to think about this is to think about fully free labor without any kind of coercion at one end of a spectrum and fully coerced labor, slave labor at the other end, but the key is all of the degrees of coercion in between. So, so again, we need to get rid of this Hegelian, you know, uh, overly simplified free labor, slave labor, even though that's part of the debate of the time. We need to understand the varieties. You know, there are many kinds of slave labor that are partially free. The economies of the South required that. Right now, I'm studying enslaved people who worked with sailors and dock workers, some of whom were free, some of whom were enslaved, to get aboard ships to escape slavery by sailing to a place where slavery had been abolished. The real relationships between enslaved laborers and wage laborers every day, and they understood each other. They worked together. So this is crucial. And then finally, just one more point uh, to support something that Caitlin said. Only recently did the history of the resistance by enslaved people begin to be combined with the history of abolitionism. Those two subjects were kept very, very far apart for a long, long time. I think uh, Manisha Sinha's book, uh, The Slave's Cause, uh, brought them together. I think there are lots of other efforts to bring them together now. So in addition to structural uh, uh, 
conflict between North and South, we also have to uh, credit uh, resistance from below as a driving uh, feature of that looming conflict. It's, I think we have come to think sometimes of freedom as being the same as being paid a wage. Yep. And I mean, one of the things I find most inspiring in looking at these account books is the way they change after the Civil War. You find eventually this day in, day out measurement of how much cotton people pick comes back. But for several decades after the Civil War, for the most part, uh, American slaves, for freed people in the South refused to be measured and monitored in the same way. And I think for them, what it meant to mean, fr mean freedom did not mean to win pay. It meant to win something much more profound. Um, but we've kind of come to have this language about freedom and slavery um, that's mostly about whether you're being paid, which of course is such a emaciated conception of what it means to be free and of what people were were trying to actually fight for. Yeah, and I also think that it allows us to look at um, ins insurgents from slaves as something that are not just insurgents, but uh, maybe another form of class struggle also, something that needs to be connected to other forms of labor movements and other forms of resistance against capitalism. I know that's something that is just for, you know, people fighting for the opportunity to be exploited as, you know, wage laborers, but as something more, I think, um, I think about only two or three years ago, there's been a republishing of um, C.L.R. James's The Black Jacobins in Germany. And I think this is a very important book, a very classical work to highlight this, you know, the Haitian revolution as maybe the first successful proletarian revolution in history, because what they were fighting for was not just to be free in the capitalist sense, but for something more. And I think this was very much highlighted by this, yeah, by this revolution. Yeah, I, 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 there are two quotations in the Black Jacobins that have really meant a lot to me over the years. The first is that the enslaved people in the sugar industry, especially, but in other industries as well, produced in their time the greatest planned accumulation of wealth the world had yet seen. Now, I think it is true that the Industrial Revolution will eclipse that, but let's not forget that this was wealth on a massive scale. And James also said in the same book that the sugar workers of uh, Saint-Domingue, which will become Haiti, were the closest thing you could find in that period in the early mid 18th century to a modern proletariat in terms of the way their lives were organized, the labor processes they engaged in. So, so again, let's not let the concepts get between us and an understanding of these continuities, mm -hmm. these things that are very deep and have been going on for a long time. Yeah, and also, uh, because you mentioned the continuities, if you look at, you know, uh, in school, when you learn about the Industrial Revolution, you learn that it started with the textile industry in Manchester. But where did the cotton for these textiles come from? I mean, this is something you can just think of yourself. You know, it's just logical to think of, okay, where did this cotton come from? And um, also, if you look at, you know, ancient forms of slavery that were much more individual and these forms of plantation slavery where it's like a commercial system of exploitation that needs the kind of accounting you mentioned, um, Caitlin, and that is completely different from, you know, more individual forms of slavery that you had in the Roman Empire on, you know. No. One, one more point that's related, I think, Pafta, is that in these talks that I've given about the slave ship, almost inevitably at some point, someone raises a hand. This would be, let's say this is in the United States. Someone raises a hand and said, my family came from Ireland. My family came from Eastern Europe. We had nothing to do with it. In other words, this is a, a distancing effect saying we had nothing to do with slavery. But all you have to do is ask a few more questions. Yeah. Uh, why did your family immigrate? to the United States? Was it a labor migration? Well, yes, it was a labor migration. Was it because the United States had a lot of higher paying jobs? Was that because the United States was a wealthier nation? Where do you think the wealth came from? 
right? So, so the point is that there's kind of, there, there's no place to stand outside of this history mm-hmm. is if you're morally superior to it. This system is so powerful and so profound and draws so many people into its operation. Uh, we just need to be aware of that. Yeah, and I think uh, contextualizing this kind of slavery within capitalism allows us to understand it as the totality it actually is, something that affects every single one of us, not not necessarily in a positive or negative way, but it affects everything, you know, we our whole history that, you know, started the, the whole modern history that we deal with, but also our whole mode of production, uh, the things we consume, but also the way we do labor ourselves. Mm-hmm. And and just to, mm-hmm. to, to be precise about this, I like to mention that the, the Atlantic slave trade, the, the slave system in the United States, I think similar things would apply in other countries, but let me talk about the case I know best. The living legacies of that system are persistent discrimination, multi-generational poverty, deep structural inequality and mass premature death. Mm -hmm. All of those things are still powerful social forces uh, that operate in the United States. And I think in most of the Western countries, and they are closely connected to the, uh, uh, the evolution of the slave systems. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, the most for a long time during my research, I was looking for connections between slave and free economies. I was looking for, um, uh, you know, a, a management writer who, you know, uh, Henry Lawrence Gant, um, who the inventor of the Gant chart, you know, he was born on a plantation and I was looking for these individual. And then about two thirds of the way through my research, I realized that this was like my approach of looking for single strands of connection just sort of missed the whole story which is that it was connected all the time and everywhere. Like the kind of every bit of cotton, not only is the, you know, the cotton going north to be woven into textiles, but then some of the cotton's being sold back south again. And this like the same thing with the kind of financial connections, like the, it's just one system um, that's growing together. And it, it does develop these antagonisms, as Marcus said. So there are these kind of these antagonisms, but it's tremendously profitable and Northern profits as well as Southern are coming out of slavery. I mean, when I talk about the Civil War with students, I say, you know, we have to figure out why did the South secede, but we also have to ask, why didn't the North just let them? And the North wants to keep the South because the North South is so economically important to the North. Um, and so it's all one, one story, but it's much easier to think of it as something separate and different, where if you're from one particular region or if you came late to the country, that you're not part of that, that story. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I would um, just continue with the Q&A session because I saw that we already have a lot of questions. And I think especially um, your point, Caitlin, about this interconnectedness already leads to the first question. So if there's nothing you two um, want to add to this, I would just continue on with the questions. Sure. Okay, there's uh, one question by Anonymous. Um, shouldn't we include uh, also talking, taking into account the impact of slavery on Africa, economically, socially, and culturally? Well, Bafta, I think as a specialist on Walter Rodney, you should answer that one. Um, I mean, I can I can start on <laughs> answering it. Maybe you can continue, Marcus. Um, I think this is an important point because I think um, I would recommend to the person who asked this, but also to everybody who's listening um, to read Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. So a new translation. There had been an old one, which is really bad um, and also had the wrong title. Um, And there's a new translation of the book that is really good and has um, a few other contributions um, that talks about the current underdevelopment of Africa. The book is already 51 years old, so it's not the current, current underdevelopment of Africa, but we can see that Africa is still a continent that is very much underdeveloped. So he talks about the effects of slavery, the slave uh, trade on especially the western coast of Africa, but also the effects of um, 
uh, colonialism that started in the end of the 19th century. So I think um, the impact of slavery in Africa has been uh, political. I think to establish this system of slave trade, a lot of the institutions that existed in Africa before pre-colonial institutions had to be destroyed. So a lot of the um, social um, networks, political institutions, social systems that existed before have been completely destroyed. There's also been um, uh, yeah, a robbery of African labor power that has been brought to the Americas and at the same time removed from Africa. So there was no real labor to build um, African economies, um, African infrastructure up um, and so on. So we can see that a lot of the current underdevelopment we can see in Africa um, also has a lot to do with slavery, not only slavery, colonialism also played its part, but um, I think these are some of the aspects that um, impacted Africa. Yeah, I would just ask people to imagine the, the loss of yeah. 13 million young, vibrant, strong people who have so much to contribute in the prime of their working lives and to extract those people from yeah. those societies. This is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, that's another expropriation of wealth the wealth of the labor that might have gone into building those societies. And I would also just remind people, I think seven or eight out of the poorest countries in the world are in West Africa. Uh, and of course, colonialism has a lot to do with that, but so does the slave trade and the inherited sense of, <clears throat> excuse me, loss, uh, exploitation, oppression over many generations uh, these these things are 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 truly connected. I mean, I can I can only agree here, and also, just as a kind of um, this is a gap in my own knowledge that's only become more apparent to me over time. That you know we have U.S. history, and then maybe U.S. history is becoming in, integrated into Atlantic history, but even Atlantic history is not really um, integrated with African history. So there's this kind of way that I think we're still not comprehending the full system um, in the extent of the impacts. Um, and there's, you know, there's like work by um, the economic historian, Nathan Nunn on trust and showing how like kind of there, you can measure impacts on like um, find community impacts over 500 years. And it's, this is not exactly the kind of economic history that I usually like, because I think it does some of the erasing of connections that we see. But it, you know, we, we can document and pick up with the, the quantitative data that we have that there are these big impacts. And it can be a starting point for, for kind of deeper exploration of the kind of very, very long term impacts of these changes. Um, and also maybe to add on that, on the um, effects uh, on Africa, I think you also have to look at it uh, not only as a history of, you know, extracting labor and extracting slaves, but also to look at the history of resistance. So if you look at um, something like, for example, the movement of Pan-Africanism, this has been something that was born in the diaspora, you know, in the Caribbean and the US, where people who were removed from Africa as slaves were talking about Africa as this not only utopian place they would go back to, but also as the real Africa it has been. Um, and also, I mean, this is also connected to the imperialist partition of Africa, you know, with the Congo conference and the, the colonial phase that started at the end of the 19th century. But I also think that if you look at this whole political landscape that exists in Africa today, the African Union and things like this, I think this is something that would not exist without slavery and the effect of, you know, this whole idea of this pan-African space that um, extends to the Caribbean and to the US where, you know, black people that were removed from Africa also live. You know, if, if you look at the slave ship and the voyage of the slave ship and the multi-ethnic, multinational Africans who are loaded onto any given ship, if you look at the process of cultural change that happens on that ship, how people begin to make accommodations and begin to connect in new ways, yeah. you look at that process from the West African side, that is a process of creating Pan-Africanism. Yeah. If you look at it from the point of view of the Western Atlantic, you could say that this is the origins 
of African-American culture, not in a national sense, but in a hemispheric sense, mm. Afro-Brazilian, Afro-Cuban, African-American. But those two processes are very closely linked. And this, of course, is uh, the source of the globalization of Black culture, of music, of the mm -hmm. profound ways in which this uh, this process has played out nationally. So, uh, so, 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 yes, the impact on West Africa is great, but so has the impact on the entire world. Yeah, exactly. Great. There's this quote by Fanon, I think it's from The Wretched of the Earth, where he says that um, Africa was invented by Europeans. And I think he may be right, but the fact that the meaning of Africa was turned into something that is, mm -hmm. um, you know, that means something cultural that is subversive, This has been an effect of the struggles of um, enslaved and formerly enslaved peoples, I would say. Okay, uh, maybe continue on with the next question. It's uh, directed at Caitlin. Um, after reading your book, I see every, every Excel sheet as a blueprint for a plantation. Uh, somehow it is <laughs> as if uh, thinking it is flattened, simplified. Could that be somehow, could it be that somehow plantation business infected our thinking, leading to column and rows and monitors? So I, I think absolutely the, the, the story of the kind of flattening of human um, experience you can see on the plantation. Um, and it looks like an Excel spreadsheet when you look at these records of people, how much cotton they pick. And also when you look at the inventories of lives where people are being having a, a market value attached to them year after year and, and planters are watching how it changes over time. Now, I, I do. I, I, I think there's a risk of seeing almost the spreadsheet as the agent of violence itself. Um, as if the kind of the spreadsheet coming into our minds uh, has kind of allowed us to perpetuate these the, the resistance. And this is a question I get asked a lot. People say, well, doesn't this just show the violence of numbers? Doesn't this show the violence of the spreadsheet? And I feel strongly that they're, you know, what the spreadsheet and the account book are doing is covering over violence, um, is facilitating technology, but that the violence itself is coming from this kind of set of human human decisions. And that to talk about the violence of numbers is to miss um, the kind of perpetrators of the violence, which are really about um, the um, slave owners themselves and about what their ownership and of capital is allowing them to do. Um, so I think it's really it's not the the I think the numbers make the violence easier. The numbers certainly make the violence more productive and more profitable. I mean, they allow. Um, force to be turned into a technology in a way that it couldn't be. But I also think there you know, the numbers themselves are just along the story. And I, I one of the things that I think is, you know, I, I, the numbers can be reinvented. Like the, the numbers are what's allowed us to go back and document the human suffering and this human tragedy. And so like the numbers were used and the thing they were used to count was money. And that's what led to the violence. But I think that the kind of the spreadsheet and the numbers and this deal, the, the um, kind of quantification as a tool itself also has the opposite possibility. And if we learn how to ask the spreadsheets different questions, and if we tally up different things, and if we also remember the people that are embedded in the spreadsheets, like kind of there's a possibility of numbers and data being used in a more liberatory process. Because I think if you're thinking at scale, you have to have the spreadsheet, you have to have the data. Um, But if we can be careful how we use it, there's this possibility for data to, to be turned around and used to, to do the opposite thing. I mean, sometimes it's the data that lets you find the resistance in the account books. It lets you see where people are withdrawing their labor or see where they're running away. And so I think there's this, the data and the abstraction is part of the story of violence, but it's also not the violence itself. The violence is being committed by people who are just trying to make as much money as they can. There's another question concerning the violence of abstraction. Uh, so I'm going to read it out. The so-called modern economic model is not only based on exploitation and slavery of people, but um, additionally, the total destruction of mother nature, partly with ir irreversible damage. We will experience this biocide. Uh, we will experience this biocide. The abstraction of violence by men 
uh, that were far away from the places where the violence happened daily. Can this violence of abstraction be compared to what uh, men and supervisory board of transnational companies do today? I mean, I think you, I, I, one of the things that um, absentee planters did was have regular reports sent back to them. They would have the daily data of the plantation compiled into a abstract that is basically like a dashboard, the same kind of thing that a modern um, CEO might be looking at. And as you roll up the layers of plantation records, more and more of the of the messiness and the violence gets erased. So kind of when you look at the day to day record on the plantation, often the violence is incredibly visible. But as it gets rolled up into a monthly um, report, it, it, it disappears and the forgetting becomes easier. Now, the person at the top is still doing the forgetting. I mean, you still have the possibility that they can ask and find out more and peel back the layers of abstraction. Um, so I really, I think that to blame too much on the tools is a mistake. On the other hand, I think the tools make it much, much easier. Um, the, the key is to be questioning what the tool is showing us and what it's not, because all of these tools um, show us something, show some things and erase others. Um, yeah. I, I would just add that anytime any analytical language dissolves the human beings into some sort of abstract system, that's the point at which you ought to be very suspicious because that will legitimate and perpetuate atrocities, whether that's a modern corporate board or the Dutch West India Company uh, sitting in Amsterdam deciding on the policy for slave trade and plantations in the West Indies. Uh, I mean, these are some of the original corporations, these slave trading operations. So, uh, so again, there's a continuity we need to keep in mind. One of the things historians do with this data is to try to peel back the biases we know. I mean, I'm working with data created by incredibly racist um, slave owners who saw people as merely inputs of production. And when you read the records, sometimes you follow their patterns of thought and you can find yourself replicating them. But most of the time you're trying to peel them back and see if you can read them against the grain to find out what else is there. Um, and I think in, in a way, this is the same practice that you see called for in like modern conversations about AI and things like that, where the big data has biases built into it. And those biases are simply going to be replicated unless we can find different ways of moving through the data and information and different ways of reading it against the grain. Because otherwise it just re replicates the biases of the people who made it of the data that it was trained on. Okay, uh, there's another question concerning um, slavery as a form of primitive accumulation. So can we understand slavery as a form of pr primitive accumulation, not once, but over centuries? I think this is directed to you, Marcus. Maybe you can also maybe elaborate on the concept of primitive accumulation. I don't know if everyone knows what it is. Okay, primitive accumulation or primary accumulation or original accumulation was a, a concept that appears in uh, chapter 28 of Capital, Volume 1. And basically, uh, Marx uses it to understand uh, the origins of capitalism. And these, he thinks, lie in, uh, in dispossession, expropriation, the removal of people from their ancestral homes. Uh, and those people, in the case of England, then become a, a mobile proletariat who are forced to sell their labor for a wage. Uh, and so in this, Marx sees the origins of the modern working class. So, so this is, this is a, kind of the background. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing now, and I think uh, this is one of the points that Caitlin uh, has been making repeatedly, is that slavery is not a primitive form of accumulation. It's a very modern and very sophisticated form of accumulation. It's only primitive when contrasted to the modern regime of accumulation that Marx and others have talked about. But I think now we're kind of working in a different direction and trying to show how these two different uh, regimes of accumulation had some common origins and some common outcomes. So I think in this way, uh, we, we can, and I think increasingly people do, 
Um, some of this is because of the work of Paul Gilroy, see slavery as a really critical part of modernity. Uh, that it's uh, that it's it, it's something that makes the modern capitalist world what it is. And one thing to to think about is, it's not that slavery is always about capital accumulation. I mean, slavery has existed and looked different at different moments in time. I think it's about how slavery in this period and place that we're talking about, the Atlantic slave trade, and then um, the West Indies and the U.S. South, becomes modern. Um, becomes highly profitable in these particular ways. It's not slavery itself that's the technology. It's that slavery is compatible with these kind of other technologies to produce this way of controlling labor and therefore being able to accumulate from it. Um, I think it it's certainly is part of a story of, of, of accumulation, um, but it doesn't mean slavery has always in all times and places been part of that story of accumulation. It's a story of this emergence of a kind of capitalist slavery um, during this particular moment. And and it, I don't know if this is true in Europe, but it, as Caitlin will know, it's very common in the United States on right wing talk radio uh, for the point to be made that, oh, there was slavery in Africa. And of course, this elides the question of how different slavery in the Americas was compared to slavery in West Africa, which was a kind of limited, more familial uh, uh, sort of institution, permitted uh, uh, escaping slavery much more easily, permitted upward mobility, uh, a very different system. But once you link slavery to a global capitalist market, in which there is an incentive literally to work people to death, you're talking about something different and something new. And that's how this, uh, this kind of particular kind of slavery is, is so modern, is so capitalist, and is so uh, brutal. The, the kind of example I gave earlier about commoditization, about people um, being traded as almost as if they're in a futures contract, is not true in other times and places. Um, this is something that emerges, and it's not even true always throughout the entire period of the slave trade and the internal slave trade, but um, it does uh, kind of approach this like extreme levels of commodification. Um, for example, you even can find price cur prices currents, like price lists that list prices for cotton, sugar, indigo commodities, and they also list enslaved people right alongside them. It's pretty rare to find that, but it shows the extent to which people could be treated as a kind of commodity. And that commodification, um, I think, is part of the story of what makes this kind of slavery so so different from what was coming before. Just as I think the, the, the wage labor that's emerging is also different from what was before. People had been paid in different yeah. ways, different places. Um, but the kind of commodification of labor is becoming much more extreme in both ways of paying, in both systems. Yeah. I would definitely agree because I think a lot of people also don't know that wage labor has existed before and in ancient times and the medieval times, there has always been, you know, wage labor, but the level of commodification is always what makes capitalism distinct from other forms of wage labor. And I think this is also something you can find with Marx um, when he talks about the commodification of labor and how the labor process itself changes within capital, you know, with um, production of relative value. So, yeah. Um, there's another question on wage labor that I find interesting. So maybe we can discuss that. Um, there's also, this is the question, uh, there's also a major difference uh, to wage labor in that it's enslavement was anti-Black racialized and Blackness could generate not post-enlightenment freedom, but only a continuation of enslaved enslavedness. Um, see Hartman's work again and uh, Patterson's work on Black social death. That's not a question, but maybe <laughs> you have thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's true. I think the racialization of, of labor is one of the most important processes going on in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th, 21st centuries. It's uh, it's fundamental. Uh, it, it, it's fundamental not only in relation to the technical division of labor, uh, it's fundamental in terms of keeping the uh, working class divided. 
Yeah. I mean, I think you can see in plantation records and then you can see again in, um, you know, 20th century labor conflict, the moments when it's advantageous for there to be racial divisions are the moments when the racial divisions come out in the records. Like planters often don't write down any inf racial information, but sometimes they do. Um, and often when they do write down this information, it's because that information is useful to them in some way. Um, and so it's it can disappear and then it can reappear based on whether it's potentially profitable. Yeah, this is interesting because this is something um, Du Bois mentions in Black Reconstruction in America, where after the abolishment of slavery, you had this um, opportunity to build, you know, um, across racial lines, uh, social structures, kind of a workers led democracy and the Jim Crow laws were actually an answer to that, you know, a continuation of um, not slavery itself, but a racially segregated form of labor in the US and the continuation of the labor that was, you know, facilitated by slave labor before. Yeah, I think there's this, there is a moment of possibility after, after the Civil War during Reconstruction where you might have had new and different allegiances. And basically, um, even though um, in some ways the Southern slave owners have been expropriated, they've lost you know, $4 billion dollars in ownership over people, they are able to maintain their dominance over capital because land is mostly returned. And so even though there has been some undermining of their power, they're allowed to regain almost all of the economic dom domination, which means that that window of possibly interracial connection is is wiped out. And it's also interesting that sometimes, you know, former slaves that were freed worked on the same plantations that worked before um, within the same labor conditions, like virtually nothing has changed except their status that was just like a formal, just a formal thing, but didn't really affect their lived reality, in fact. Yeah. There's another question directed to you, Marcus. Um, could you maybe recommend a book on working conditions, law and law enforcement or punishment of sailors on ships in the 17th and 19th, 18th century? I can, because I wrote that book. Uh, it's called uh, Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, um, Merchant Sailors, Pirates, and the Anglo-American Maritime World, 1700-1750, published by Cambridge University Press. Um, there's been a lot of good work on sailors recently, but that's uh, that's one that uh, is really kind of a labor history to understand what sailors' working lives were like. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and maybe one last question. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, hasn't capital just outsmarted us, making us commodify ourselves so as not to revolt over apparent working conditions? Well, yes. I mean, <laughs> I mean, here we are. We're we're stuck in the system. We haven't escaped it. So so. Uh, Noam Chomsky likes to talk about the manufacturing of consent. Uh, and I think that's that's a useful idea. But I do think that uh, people still know, and with a deep sense of disquiet, that things aren't right. Uh, how people choose to act on that understanding is uh, complicated and variable from place to place. We're seeing now... I think a, a massive reaction against capitalist globalization, which is taking a far right populist form. Um, I think uh, some of that same energy could be turned towards more more progressive solutions. But uh, but yeah, we we do become complicit in the perpetuation of uh, capitalism. There's no question about it. It's it's a powerful system, and it's very hard to stand outside it much harder than it was in times past because uh, capitalist social relations are much more all encompassing. I mean, I think this is in a way thinking about what, what do we make of the history of slavery for our, for our current moment? 
one time I was doing an interview and a journalist said, well, aren't we all just slaves sitting at our desks nine to five? And I was like, definitely not. You know, there's this way that, you know, we can misuse and misthink about the history of slavery and, and miss the ways that we, you know, being able to quit your job, being able, like there are these kind of fundamental freedoms that, that enslaved people didn't have. And so we, there are these kind of perils in thinking about how to talk about slavery. On the other hand, the history of slavery, I think has, can help us to locate the coercion in different places. And when I teach the US, the history survey, you know, it's an ongoing question how we read the civil war. Is this a moment of continuity where we just see a system of oppression that's remade? Or is it a moment of revolution where we see really transformative changes? And I think it's both. And I think we're in another moment where we have both these kind of potential stories here. We have, um, on the one hand, I mean, there's lots of things that point to the story of, of um, story of this being about continuity, where slavery is still with us today. But then on the other hand, we have, you know, emerging labor movements, more labor organization than we've seen in a long time. We have people who are cognizant of um, the connections between this labor story um, and um, and enduring racism. And there's a, I mean, I'm optimistic that we. <laughs> We're in a moment where something new is going to be made, made out of that. Um, just from my classes, my students, I teach a course on the history of capitalism. And when I first started teaching it, most of the students were in the, well, it's the best thing we've got. You know, it, it could be better, but it's pretty good. And now most of my students are deeply, deeply critical. Um, uh, they don't necessarily know what the neck, what how they want to replace it or what they what what to do um, in that situation. But I think that the mood about whether capitalism requires radical change has has definitely shifted. Yeah, I, I think there are more people in the U.S. who identify as socialists than there have been for the last hundred years. This is partly thanks to Bernie Sanders, but but here, but to continue Caitlin's message of hope, <laughs> you know, a rare thing these days, a, a, a precious commodity. Uh, I was once talking with Howard Zinn, the great. A historian from below, people's historian. And he made a very interesting point. He said, uh, I travel around the country. He said, and this was this was probably 15 years ago or so, but let's say late 90s, mid 90s. He said, I see more people involved in some kind of progressive activism than existed at the height of the movements of the 60s and 70s. There are actually more people doing that work today than there were then, but there's one big difference. Back then, people felt they were all part of the same movement, yeah. that part of a movement culture. And, and I think one of the ways that the established powers dealt with those movements was to pulverize them and separate them. And, 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 and basically, it's, I think it's a really important task for the future to recreate ideas that can that can allow us to connect the dots, so to speak, that we can overcome those divisions and see that we can, that the people who work on uh, women's issues have important things in common with people who work on the environment, who have important things with people in common with people who work on labor. Uh, so, so, so again, I think there are lots of people out there waiting for some kind of new, more um, powerful connective movement to emerge, and uh, and I think we can do that. I think it's still possible. Yeah, I would definitely agree, and I think it's also, um, in some ways, I think it's impossible to really. Um, oppress this need for resistance against capitalism because fundamentally capitalism is just this inhumane system that goes against what humanity is actually about so you can always see different forms of resistance against capitalist against capitalism throughout the history of capitalism the question is always more about what form this resistance takes is it directed is it um organized you know is it interconnected with other movements i think that is the more important question and i would also agree that within the last years i can see a re re-emerging of hope and i think that's what people are actually missing because i think more people than we know uh actually have a lot of issues with capitalism and they also know about it they know that capitalism is not 
the best system there is. But I think what's actually missing is um, a form to resist against capitalism that doesn't feel hopeless and an alternative that feels, you know, viable. And I feel like within the last years, we can really see uh, that something like this is re-emerging. Maybe it's just wishful thinking, but I would love to think so. Okay, so there are some questions left, but uh, we are at the end of our time, so I, I would suggest we finish it here. Um, is there anything you, Marcus, or you, Caitlin, would like to add on to your points or maybe some closing remarks? Well, thank you for, for this. It's been a great conversation. I would, I mean, I think the most inspiring thing I find and we've been talking about the civil war is to, th if we can think about the civil war as a radical remaking at the hands of abolitionists and enslaved people and capitalism certainly survives the civil war. But if you can think about it as a, what a tremendous vision for how capitalism might have been remade and it's unsuccessful, but it's a model for, I think, the imagining the scale of change that we can, can hope for ourselves. So the, 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 in, the way enslaved people survive overthrow and remake um, in resistance to capitalism is just, a, a, I think, an enduring source of inspiration. And what we have to do, Caitlin, is to make this kind of history more readily understood by the general public. Because what scholars know and what activists know is quite different from what most people know in the United States. So, so there is a, a struggle to be waged to make, uh, to make this inspiring history known. One of the worst things that can happen in periods of defeat, when you feel like movements have been uh, defeated, one of the, is, is, is basically to know that you are not alone. Because the logic of defeat is to separate, to isolate. And just to know your history to know that there were thousands and tens of thousands of people who fought for the same things that you're fighting for. And they failed and they got squashed and some of them got killed, but that doesn't mean they were wrong. So, so I still think that the teaching of history, the learning of history, especially by activists, is one of the most important things that we can contribute to because this is, uh, this is where the spark for change can, can come from. Yeah, thank you for your um, inspiring closing remarks and for having this book presentation and first and foremost for writing these books. But also thank you to the audience for your questions, for the vivid discussion. And uh, we hope to see you at the next event and have a nice evening.